um, thanks very much to Emma and the British Art Network for inviting me uh, to take part today. And as my title suggests, my talk is going to examine the relationship between tourism, urban improvement, and an idea of future ruin in 18th century London. And in particular, by thinking about how um, uh, an increase in sort of publication of tourist aids leads to a kind of more critical conception of what London looks like and with it plans and proposals for sort of changing uh, the appearance of the city. So in the 18th century, a number of tourist aids begin to be printed uh, that distinguish themselves from surveys and histories by mapping out the city in particular ways and imagining uh, a specific kind of readership. So around the late 17th, early 18th century, portable accounts of London that map out the city sites via a descriptive tour uh, and which offer practical information on entrance to key sites as well as any fees to be paid or kind of customary tips begin to be published for visitors to London. And uh, these works kind of map London in a very particular uh, way for, as I said, particular kinds of readers. So mainly visitors to London with a short amount of time who want a sense of the most important places to see and uh, information on how to gain access to them. And while they address a broad range of strangers, a number of them particularly address foreign visitors, either in their title pages uh, or, for example, via the use of a dual language format, which is what um, a new guide to London does. It has its material in parallel English and French pages. And so the examples here show how different kinds of works uh, of this kind were cross advertised and presented to purchasers as complementary works. The Bowles family of map print and booksellers were involved in the production of tourist aids over the course of the century. And um, here are some early examples that advertise related works. So on the left, we have John Bowles' map of the cities of London, Westminster, and Southwark, a pocket map for um, visitors, which uh, down here on the bottom left-hand side advertises um, a series of views of London. Um, it doesn't give the specific title, but um, seems to be the same series of views that are published here in the guidebook as well. And publishers dealing in tourist aids in the 18th century frequently cross-advertise in this manner. So guidebooks were frequently offered for sale with or without a map, and the map could be bound within the guidebook um, or else pasted on cloth and presented in a slipcase as a way of uh, preventing excessive wear and tear and increasing its sort of portability. So taken together, works like guidebooks, pocket maps, and series of views of the city mapped out the key sites and helped visitors to orient themselves. So the descriptive tour not only highlights particular locations that a visitor might want to see, but can also help to the visitor to find their way to sites of interest uh, at a time when street names weren't posted at street corners, something that doesn't begin to happen until the 1760s and is part of the um, discussion of, of urban improvements, particularly with the kind of stranger in mind to help them map and find their way um, without having to ask uh, rude uh, and kind of anti-foreign sort of Londoners uh, for directions as one uh, improver puts it. But as you can see from this example of the three interconnected works published by the Bowles brothers in the 1720s, they work together to help the visitor to navigate his or her way around London. So the print offers an architectural view and could also be thought of as a kind of souvenir item or for someone who can't make it to London, a kind of alternative visual tour of the key sites. The description in the guide, which um, pretty much maps onto so the, the series of views, maps onto the descriptive tour. So they appear in the same order uh, in the book. Um, enables the reader to situate his or herself in relation to a building um, by way of that descriptive language. So uh, in the bit on the right, you can see that we're given information such as the West Front featuring the statue of Queen Anne. So if someone's then going to have to follow on to kind of continue east, that the kind of the placement of the statue and that kind of description helps you to work that out. And the pocket map also features an architecture elevation to mark the spot of St. Paul's. So we can see this as a different kind of visual aid to help the user to orient themselves in relation to a landmark. So you kind of look for that building on the map and then you can find your way around from there. 
Now, in mapping out the city for a stranger, writers of guidebooks both celebrated aspects of London and anticipated criticism of particular locations. And in so doing, these writers imagined how London might appear to foreigners whose own capital cities might have more of architectural magnificence and grandeur. So to give one example that you can find this in guidebooks throughout the 18th century, a new guide to London tells its readers in its account of St. James's Palace that they must not be surprised if it does not answer the magnificence of a royal palace and particularly the palace of a king of Great Britain. So this idea of kind of managing expectations a bit. So from the early 18th century, London's lack of grandeur seemed at odds with its reputation and status for global commerce. And many writers lamenting the appearance of London saw the rebuilding of the city after the Great Fire as a missed opportunity to remap the city's contours and to adorn it with magnificent architecture. And just as tourist aids in imagining the outsider's perspective preempted criticisms by voicing their own sense of where London's reputation might be at odds with the appearance of the city, Works debating the appearance of London in this period frequently pointed to the figure of the foreign tourist as a reason for investing in the appearance of London. So Nicholas Hawksmore in his remarks on the Royal Hospital at Greenwich noted that magnificent structures not only employed vast numbers of, of the poor in building, long remained historical to posterity, but also drew crowds of strangers to see them to the sm no small advantage to the country were cultivated. We may instance Rome, for example, and many other cities, for though there are many devices to draw in foreigners, yet their admiral and stupendous buildings have no small share in captivating the attention of strangers to the great advantage of the inhabitants and greatly owing to the encouragement of arts and architecture for their so many eminent fabrics. James Ralph in his critical review of the public buildings, statues and ornaments published in the following decade also points to Italy as an example for understanding how grand architectural works can attract foreign visitors and um, quite explicitly here, their money. So Ralph says that one of the chief reasons why Italy is so generally visited by all foreigners of genius and distinction is owing to the magnificence of their structures and their number and variety. They are a continual bait to invite their neighbors to lay out their money amongst them. And one might reasonably assert that the sums which have been expended for the bare sight of those elegant piles have more than paid the original charge of their building. One of the things that I've become interested in recently uh, is the period of the 1760s as a kind of moment of renewed urgency about questions relating to the appearance of London and the kinds of urban improvements that should take place and what, um, what they might tell the future about this kind of moment. So this is a moment when Britain's massive territorial gains in the Seven Years' War made it the center of a global empire and many wished that the city did more to look the part. In articulating these concerns, men like John Gwynne, an architect who also campaigned for the establishment of the Royal Academy and was one of its founding members when it opened in this decade, pointed to the possibility of tourists now and in the future, even when nothing but the ruins of the present would remain. And like Ralph, he also makes a case for the financial benefits of tourism. So Gwynne argues that we all know that the chief sources of wealth to many fallen states are the remains of their ancient magnificence and the constant confluence of foreigners to those places supply the deficiencies of manufacture and commerce. The sums expended by foreigners may be considered as a laudable tax on their curiosity, whose ideas being excited by fame can never be satisfied but by ocular demonstration. And had we more ample means of gratifying that thirst after novelty and amusement, numbers would continually flock over to our nation as we continually do to theirs. So there's an increasing kind of sense uh, that tourism is profitable, both for kind of, you know, businessmen. So the Bowles family kind of publishes tourist aids throughout the 18th century that they kind of corner the market in a way for these kinds of works, um, but also at a kind of national level in terms of creating jobs, um, but also creating um, a range of visitors who will come to London and spend their money. For Gwynne and others, this moment when Britain appeared to have reached the apex of its powers needed to be commemorated and memorialized for future generations. Yet while the country seemed to have proved itself in terms of commerce and martial power, it appeared to be lagging behind in the arts. So Gwynne's twin ventures in this decade, the publication of London and Westminster Improved, and his campaigning for the founding of the Royal Academy, 
are closely connected. So a powerful empire needs artists to celebrate its achievement, to capture this moment of glory in a way that will enable future generations to contemplate it. Now, in thinking about the relationship between um, improvement and future decline and about shaping the kind of landscape of the city in a way that kind of marks a particular historical moment and how that moment might be interpreted in the future, I want to look briefly at two visual presentations of new buildings in the 18th century and how that sense of future ruin plays into these visual accounts. So this is Robert Milne's, uh, the architect Robert Milne's image of Blackfriars Bridge under construction uh, as engraved by the Italian artist Giovanni Battista Piranesi. In this image, the spectacle of incompleteness introduces a double meaning. The wooden support frames used in the construction of the arches, one of which is tiled and one of which is yet to be so, clearly gesture to the act of construction as process, as do the workmen operating pulleys at the top of each arch. While various features make clear that the bridge is going up rather than falling into disrepair, the partial columns of varying height rising from the platforms, you can see them here uh, and here as well, rising from the platforms near the bridge's base, invoke the kind of classical ruins that feature in Piranesi's views of Rome. Milne's view brings past and present into dialogue in a manner that implies what future ruin might look like, at the same time that in echoing the architectural forms of ancient Rome, it announces mid 18th century Britain as the inheritor of the classical past. And this sense of, uh, you know, Gwynne makes a similar argument that we are now what the Romans were of old, so that we need this kind of architectural um, shaping of the city so that it can sort of last the test of time, even as sort of ruins. So this idea of kind of, we are inheritors of the classical past and we now have to kind of undertake this construction of a sort of monumental landscape of sorts uh, to sort of, you know, to be evidence of this moment in the future. This is also kind of, you know, visible a bit in Joseph Michael Ganzi's uh, bird's eye view of the Bank of Ind uh, England, which similarly gestures towards what future ruin might look like. Um, when I was looking this up on the Soane Museum's website, I noticed that they emphasize that this is not an image of the Bank of England in ruins, that many people talk about it in this way, but that neither Soane nor Gandhi had ever um, imagined it as or presented it as um, a meditation on the bank in ruins, and that instead it's more accurately a cutaway showing um, the kind of architectural details inside the building. But I think even if a meditation on the bank uh, in the state of future ruin is not the image's primary aim. It certainly gestures towards that prospect. And I think the fact that the cutaway doesn't use clean lines, but instead evokes a kind of crumbling structure, as well as the surrounding trees, which strip the bank of its immediate context, do some of the work of looking ahead to a future moment, and one in which nature is beginning to uh, reclaim the city. There's also in the 1760s, um, a sort of fictional series of letters from uh, an American to a friend back home in America about visiting London and finding it in this kind of state of decline. It's imagined as being written sort of a hundred years uh, onwards, but that sense of kind of nature taking over the city of kind of not being able to get to St. Paul's because cracked paving and sort of, you know, grass and trees sort of shooting up all around um, is part of the problem. So I think that kind of that introduction of nature is part of that ruin process. And just by uh, way of ending, I wanted to touch very briefly a kind of quick glance at um, Gustav Dory's New Zealander of 1872, uh, which is a meditation on Thomas Babington Macaulay's invocation in 1840 of the figure of a New Zealander who, quote, shall in the midst of a vast solitude take his stand on a broken arch of London Bridge to sketch the ruins of St. Paul's. Babington and Doré's New Zealanders are perhaps the most famous meditations on the connections between the foreign visitor, urban improvements as signaled by the astonishing cluster of buildings in Doré's image and future ruin. But as I hope to have suggested, these connections have a much longer history that can be traced through the emergence of tourist aids and plans for and complaints about the appearance of London over the course of the 18th century. Thank you.